I started this work about 10 years ago, in 2002. I was an assistant commissioner at the New York City Health Department. I had uh, done some work on syndromic surveillance, helping create this national practice. And we had hooked up 59 hospital emergency departments, uh, kicking every interface once a week to make sure that it still worked. We hooked up with pharmacies, school health clinics, and I started working with the Institute for Family Health, later became a Davies Award winner, uh, with their ambulatory electronic health record, doing kind of big data analysis to try to understand uh, what was happening with the health of populations. After Commissioner Frieden, now director of the Center for Disease Control, joined the health department, uh, he asked me to focus on chronic diseases, taking a look at how we were doing uh, by assembling a team, we had about a dozen PhDs eventually, and data, data from surveys, data from hospitalization records, vital statistics, syndromic surveillance, to have a look at the health of our communities and what could be done, what interventions could be done to address them. What we found was, yes, remarkable disparities between different neighborhoods, some separated by mere yards, but also across all communities, some gaps in care that were surprising for a public health person. And this was confirmed in really the life-changing for us paper that came out in 2003 by Beth McGlynn, observing that the right care, care that we all knew was the right care, was only delivered about half the time. So what could we do as public health department to try to address this? Where would we try to make our stand? We turned to an idea of using health IT to bake in prevention and public health. We were able to get $60 million from uh, Mayor Bloomberg with a commitment, and we began to assemble a team a director of a federally qualified health center, a quality improvement person from a VA, a McKinsey consultant. And we began looking for a product that could do what we knew could help improve care, measure quality so you can see and improve the quality of care you're delivering, registry functions so you can make a list of patients who need that reminder decision support tools at the point of care. And what we found five years ago, six years ago, was really no product that we saw had what we had expected to be there. So we chose an, what was then an upstart uh, and began working over the next 18 months on an intensive development joint development project. Mondays, we would talk about requirements. Fridays, we would look at what they had produced. And back and forth, we went. We also started calling the providers, the health centers, the hospitals in the city's poorest neighborhoods. It took an average of 23 contacts. An average of 23 contacts to enroll them in the program. Eventually, we got half of all primary care doctors in the city's three poorest neighborhoods in the Bronx and central Brooklyn and South Harlem. We provided project management, helped them get lab interfaces, helped them with public health reporting, helped them get patient-centered medical home status eventually, panel managers, billing specialists, lots of failures and frustrations issues of training and the ability of the office staff to deal with the new technology. Bug fixes and bug fixes and version control. The insanity of billing. 
but more than that, a fundamental difficulty in changing practices to focus on population health management where the reimbursement system was exactly the opposite, where it was all about piecework and fee-for-service and time and materials. We had thought quality measurement would lead the way, but with the measures we had at that time, quality measurement was really difficult to incorporate into the electronic health records and into the workflows of the practices. Health plans wouldn't change their approach because they said too few doctors can report on EHR-generated quality measures. We tried lots of new ideas, natural language processing. We had lots of failures. We tried to get Medicaid medication history a click away, and no one clicked. We connected to multiple Rios, and no one searched. We got foundation money to pay docs for outcome, and it didn't make a difference. We added more staff, privacy lawyers. We added a nurse informaticist whose job it was to remind us to think about the patient in every meeting. We even had our own resident skeptic. I know some of you are in the audience. <laughs> whose job it was to keep us grounded in reality, and lots of great project managers and analysts laid off from Wall Street after the collapse. That was great news for us. <laughs> we were all learning on the job, but we persevered, we kept on it, what you might call grit. Eventually, we had 229 out of 230 successful implementations. That one still eats at me and a 10 percentage point improvement in outcomes like blood pressure control and lipid control. So now we're at 2009 and the stimulus bill is making its way forward and people in Washington want to hear about what my friend Mickey Trapathy and I talked about this, these extension center ideas. And they asked, what would it take to wire up the entire nation? And we said, well, 20 billion? But we figured it's only about 1% of what we spent on healthcare. Well, now it's 0.6%, I think. And after the HITECH Act passed, a fellow named John Glasser called me up and said, um, we have a, would you like to co-chair a working group with Paul Tang to define, recommend a definition for this revolutionary but really indistinct concept of meaningful use? And by June of 2009, we had drafted this fundamental framework that's still at the heart of meaningful use. The health IT incentive program starts with health. I think any CIO in the audience will tell you that, uh, you've probably heard this from them, don't tell me what you want me to build. Tell me what you're trying to do. And so it was with meaningful use. What we're trying to do is improve health and health care in distinct ways. To get care that's safer, that's higher quality, more efficient, more coordinated, more patient-centered. To help lead us to a place where we can prevent a million heart attacks and strokes in the next five years. Where we can reduce hospital-acquired conditions by 40% in the next three years. Where we can reduce readmissions by 20% over the next three years. We set our eyes on that North Star, and then we look down at our feet, make sure that the steps that we take are achievable and incremental. And we take step after step forward on a fundamental roadmap towards that North Star. But here's the problem. The road wasn't built. <laughs> And there were a lot of people who couldn't access the roads that were built. There was an infrastructure that was lacking. 
And the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act wasn't just about short-term stimulus through tax cuts and help to states to avoid layoffs to teachers and policemen and public health workers. About a third of it was set aside for the reinvestment part, reinvesting in infrastructure. And it wasn't just roadways and runways and railways. It was also the information highway. So the newly named national coordinator, David Blumenthal, asked me to join ONC as his deputy to help implement the policies and the programs to help build this infrastructure. The legislation established the Health IT Regional Extension Program, taking what we had done and extending it now throughout every part of this country. We have 62 local nonprofits who are responding to local needs with local solutions but making sure that small primary care practices, rural health clinics, critical access hospitals aren't left behind. Over the past two years, these extension centers have worked with 130,000 primary care providers. They've worked with 70% of rural primary care providers to make sure that they're not left behind. The legislation also directed funds towards the states, making sure that there is a health IT coordinator in every state who could coordinate what's happening with public health and Medicaid and broadband, make sure that policies were conducive to information exchange, make sure that every provider in the state, including those in rural and underserved areas, had access to some means of health information exchange to let them achieve meaningful use and beyond. To help address the workforce shortage, we worked with universities to create and open source a health IT curriculum that's been at 132,000 units downloaded. A competency exam with AHIMA, with universities and community colleges to help create 10,000 graduates a year to help meet the workforce shortage. We funded research consortia to develop the tools and the techniques of the future in 17 beacon communities, everywhere from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to the Mississippi Delta and San Diego, to demonstrate what the future of health IT is today. And we worked with CMS to launch a new competitive certification program and the Health IT Incentive Program, and the results have been breathtaking. We've made more progress on adoption of electronic health records in the past two years than we had done as a nation in the past 20. <laughs> By next year, I predict that the majority of care delivered in this country in hospitals and doctor's offices will be done on electronic health records, not paper. And the entire health IT ecosystem is shifting. In 2009, 40% of rural pharmacies couldn't accept an electronic prescription. That's now less than 10%, thanks to meaningful use and declining. Nearly 190,000 eligible professionals and over 3,200 eligible hospitals have registered for the health IT incentive program, and the pace of incentive payments is accelerating. More than 2,000 eligible hospitals and over 40,000 EPs have received payments totaling $3.1 billion. $500 million in January alone. We're on track to exceed 100,000 providers a year, and I need your help to do it. <laughs> According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, more than 50,000 jobs have been created in IT in healthcare alone. This is one of the real bright spots of the economy. The health IT industry is healthier than ever before. Venture capital investments are up. And innovative startups throughout this audience are tapping into the opportunities and the mission of using health IT to improve health and health care. But we need more than adoption and meaningful use in individual doctors' offices and hospitals to succeed. We need interoperability and exchange. 
This requires a different infrastructure, an infrastructure for standards, an infrastructure for rules of the road that can enable trust to emerge, and payment systems that encourage care coordination. That, too, is happening. In 2009, the digital infrastructure was suffering from a lack of widely adopted and well-specified standards. Each interface was one-off, like the ones I used to build to the hospitals in New York City, needing point-to-point -point negotiation, costing the providers thousands of dollars and costing the technology companies their most precious asset, their engineers. We quickly adopted what interoperability standards we could in 2010 and got to work. We needed to establish clear standards for vocabularies, for how things like medications and medical problems are expressed, standards for how these are packaged together, like the laboratory results or care summaries, and the standards and protocols for how to securely use the internet to exchange information. Now, despite the urgency, we resisted the temptation to throw money and a beltway bandit or two at the problem. We consulted with the gurus of successful open source development communities, and we created a model where government's role is really that of the, what we call the impatient convener that sets the goal, like uh, we need transport protocols to support meaningful use. Sets the principles and the criteria for what success looks like. Widely adoptable, simple, secure, modular. The rules of the road, running code and rough consensus. And the timeline, 90 days to initial consensus, 90 days to working reference implementations, 90 days to pilots after that. Using this approach, we can now propose a stage two of meaningful use and certification criteria, a real push ahead on exchange requirements for meaningful use, and the interoperability criteria for EHRs, and we have done so. <laughs> By 2014, every EHR will be able to send and receive documents and images securely. Every EHR can use a single standard for receiving laboratory results, for sending public health reports and care summaries to other providers, to every patient. Every EHR will be able to generate the data elements using the same codes for medications, laboratory results, procedures, problem lists, and immunizations. We're going to be moving ahead this year on establishing some of the rules of the road for trusted exchange entities and how they keep and use data and how patient privacy and security is maintained. There's a massive river flowing of advance in health IT, and there's no going back. But alongside this massive trend are two other societal trends that we have to intertwine with to twist health IT into alignment with if we're going to create a new triple strand of DNA for our nation's healthcare system. I'm talking about delivery and payment reform on the one hand and consumer empowerment and engagement on the other. Let me give you an example. I visited uh, Dr. Gustin Ho in San Francisco a few months ago. He's a solo practitioner. His wife's the practice manager. With the help of his regional extension center, he'd adopted an electronic health record and had configured his workflows so he could efficiently see the patients who crowd his waiting room every day. 10 to 15 minute visits. Bam, bam, bam. Three rooms going. Bam, bam, bam. Bam, bam, bam. Fee for service. That's his life. Do an encounter, you get paid regardless of the quality, the care coordination, regardless of whether the patient gets admitted to the hospital or not. But that's changed. He's now getting 180% of Medicaid fee-for-service payments because his IPA has shown that they reduced admissions to the hospital. His IPA is 
wants to become an ACO. They're working with a startup in San Mateo to index and analyze the data in their EHR to be able to understand who's going to be most at risk of being hospitalized. They've implemented a sharing network among the providers in that IPA and the hospital. And he described to me, really quite emotionally, this one meeting, he remembered it exactly, where he was sitting in a committee room and they were discussing whether other providers should be able to just open up his notes, his notes. And he said, these are my notes. Why should I let somebody else look at my notes? There are these little notes I write to myself. And then they had become these things that he had to click on to get paid. And he talked about this transformative moment when he realized they're not his notes, they're not the health plan's notes, they're the patient's notes. So we're seeing this driver, this thrust of payment reform, whether it's value-based purchasing, whether it's accountable care, coordinated care, shared savings, patient-centered medical home, pay for performance, value-based purchasing, doesn't matter what you call it, doesn't matter how it's implemented, and there's a lot of uncertainty about how exactly it's going to be implemented. Medicare is leading, but so are the states, so are the private health plans. There is a massive change underway. And what we do know is that to be prepared, we need information and information tools. If we want to reduce readmissions, there's an intervention for that. Whether the patient goes home, which is discharge summary and appointment with a primary care doc, whether the patient goes to skilled nursing facility, which is make sure they know what the medications are and the fall risks are. There are interventions for improving quality, registry functions and quality measurement and decision support. And they're all part of meaningful use. Meaningful use is the platform, or should I say, Making meaningful use of meaningful use can be the foundation for providers to help prepare them to not just survive, but thrive in the new healthcare economics. Importantly, now, quality matters. Organizations that had never considered population health management are now intent. The, we're seeing that in the market. We're seeing that in HIMSS's priorities for this year. Big data, patient engagement, small practices. And it's fundamentally a return to the ethos of medicine where the relationship between patient and provider is more than the relationship between shoe seller and shoe purchaser. Where we don't wait for the patient to just walk in the door and then say, how can I help you? Where we have a responsibility to the population of our patients. And if they don't come in, those are the ones that we need to be most worried about. Engaged and empowered patients. I went to my clinic where I get care, and I was speaking to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist said, here's your medication, make sure you take it, you know, every night. And I said, well, it's easier for me to take it in the morning. Pushy patient. And he said, take it at night. And I said, what's the half-life? So here he goes, he's like, okay, let me see. So the screen's like this, right? I can't see the screen. Clickety-clack, clickety moves the mouse, clickety-clack. The seconds tick by. He's in his, I'm sure, very expensive pharmacy management information system, looking up the half-life. He's like this. 
And both of us realize, as the seconds tick by, that we could both pull out our smartphones and Google the damn thing. <laughs> so that's changing everything. Patients now have the tools at their fingertips. Remember I talked about all the things that we tried in New York? One of the things we tried was to do a texting pilot with patients who hadn't showed up. My God, was that difficult five years ago. It was like, what network are they on? We've got to collect the information on it, and people don't use it, and how about the elderly? You know, more the rate of cell phone use among individuals over the age of 65 this year was higher than the use of cell phones in any age group five years ago. What was so difficult back then to operationalize, this texting application, we awarded a $75,000 challenge yesterday to someone who grew a small group who took a quality measurement tool called Pop Health, and they took the patients who were either in the denominator or the numerator that you want to reach out to, and they created for a $75,000 app challenge, an incredibly elegant way of reaching out to them, not just sending them a message, but of being able to record messages back, punch one, to collect information back, called Popeye. You should go see it. Popeye. That's what technology brings. Yes, it's about health. That's what we're here for. Yes, it's about information. It's better to know than not know. But it's also about technology. And what technology is, is the unique promise that tomorrow it's going to be better. Tomorrow is going to be cheaper, and tomorrow is going to be easier. That's what technology brings to the table. I visited uh, Grand Junctions, Colorado, one of our Beacon communities, a few weeks ago. Any town USA, except that half the doctors in the community are part of the Beacon community's learning collaborative. And they're learning to do things like planned visits, like huddles before the day starts, all enabled by the technology. They're doing these improvement collaboratives in cohorts. And you walk through their get together, and the first cohort shows the pictures of the staff and what they hope to accomplish and their values and principles. The fourth cohort is showing run charts. That's the learning process, to go from agreeing that we need to do population health management to figuring out what the hell does that mean and how can we implement it in practice. We're learning. We've got a lot of work to do. I know that a lot of the vendors are still learning, not just how to meet the certification criteria, not just meet the criteria, but actually make it usable in the provider workflows. We still don't have enough information on the magnitude and the root causes of health IT-associated adverse events. Rural providers still face higher barriers we have to assure that it's not just the doctors and hospitals, but their trading partners, pharmacies, labs, long-term care, public health, that they can exchange information with on the other side. Long-term care, you're talking about reducing readmissions. Behavioral health, home health. The workforce needs of vendors and providers is far from met. We need apprenticeships and internships. We still don't have quality measures that are parsimonious, that are broad-based, that make use of the best of electronic health records, not tap into the worst of them. That are designed from the ground up to take advantage of the strength of EHRs. Integration of patient-generated data and observations and the experience of care into routine health care is still in its infancy. There's a lot of education and guidance we still need around privacy and security. 
Big data analytics on clinical data for secondary use needs not just the technology, but also the policy and privacy framework for that. We heard about standard and open APIs for EHR modules and device integration. Coordination on all these issues between programs within the federal government, whether it's with CMS, with FDA, with SSA, with DOD, with VA, with OIG, the whole alphabet soup, and between public and private, and the states, is an ongoing challenge and opportunity. Change takes time. Change takes innovation. It takes sustained will. But we're on the right track to make meaningful use of meaningful use. The Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT is a very small but dedicated agency in the federal government. We stand at the intersection of these issues and we're proud to serve. With you, we have set a course and we will be steadfast partners with you on this voyage. We're going to listen. We're going to listen some more. We're going to engage and partner with you, with all stakeholders, in democratic and transparent processes. We're going to set our eye on the prize and our feet on the ground. We're going to set ambitious but achievable goals, and we're going to achieve them through incremental steps. We're going to use a market-based approach, but we're also going to make sure that we ensure that there is a safe and effective industry that helps everybody. I salute your daily work in our shared mission to place the patient and their interests in the center of everything we do. I'm honored and privileged to serve you. Thank you. Surprise! <laughs> Thank you, Farzad. Oh, can you stay on stage with me to answer a few questions, please? Sure. <laughs> Come on back. <laughs> Thank you so much for your insights into the current state. I would have spoken longer, Holly, <laughs> but no. Of health IT from a national perspective. We do. Um, know that the audience has found this incredibly valuable as they seek their own solutions for their organizations. We have a few questions that sure. we'd like to ask. And uh, these have actually been coming in from HIMSS group LinkedIn. And the first one is from Colin. And he asks, given the high volume of paper-based information and the expanding consumerism of healthcare, what technology do you see most improving US healthcare during the next three years? I think we've set the, a really strong foundation with making sure that we can actually have digital information available. And to put in place the changes that need to happen at the retail level. And it's going to be, you know, it's, it's trench warfare. It's, it's office by mm -hmm. office. You can't, you know, you can't skip the step of actually workflow and integration and training and so forth. But I think the sharing of information has really dramatic possibilities once the information is digital to turn that liquid, to give consumers access to that information mm -hmm. and let them do the three A's, right? To access the information, to have the, the belief that they, it's okay for them to get their own data and then to do something with that information once they get it. It's really the three A's are a core part of our consumer e-health program. And I think that's gonna be one of, the, one of the biggest and most surprising, perhaps, most scalable uh, uh, ways in which we're gonna get improved uh, health in our country, not just better disease care. Thank you. The next question that we had coming in is, I believe from Nancy, also from the LinkedIn website, is there a plan in the works to assist those who have completed the ONC high-tech workforce development programs with job placement? 
I'm thinking of internships, yes. mentoring programs, others. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so anyone who is looking for skilled healthcare workers, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, discuss. No, that's basically what we have to do, is we have to make sure that the trainees have the skills they need. And a big part of that is internship opportunities with real healthcare uh, settings. So in Ohio, the Ohio Hospital Association is partnering with the community colleges to make sure that there are those internship uh, opportunities. We need to massively blow that out. Mm -hmm. The other thing that trainees need is actual experience with real life EHRs that people out there are going to be using. So we really ask and welcome uh, the EHR vendors to make available their uh, systems in sandlots so that the students can learn from those and have really the practical skills to be able to help both them and the practices in effective implementation. Great. We have another question, and I think you partially answered this in your talk, but uh, Steve wants to know, what steps is ONC taking to facilitate collaborative care by ensuring that stage two meaningful use will require some elements of health information exchange capability um, up to and including secure exchange of clinical information beyond the CCD? Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, starting with the uh, consolidated CDA is a really good step, as you know. As I know. As you know well. Um, a question near and dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you should answer this question. Um, <laughs> but I think we, ha we take incremental steps. Mm -hmm. We define what are the data elements that are needed in the transition of care work that took place. Um, within a nine-month period, the community that you were such an important part of resolved over a thousand negative ballots to be able to get this mm -hmm. to the point where we can include it. And this process usually takes years, was sh compressed down in nine months, mm -hmm. so we can have it as part of stage two. So that's what we need to do. We need to keep pushing uh, and adding as we can incrementally. So mm -hmm. in the transition of care is now added a care plan mm -hmm. and team members mm -hmm. to essential new data elements to help do that coordination of care. I will say, the patient, again, I, I'm gonna come back to this theme. My, when my mom left the hospital, and she went to outpatient doc. No paper, no electronic trail followed her. And the outpatient doc turned to her and said, tell me about your complicated hospitalization with you know, vascular complications, infectious complications, and cardiac complications. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. Yeah. If we're going to put patients in that position, as we do daily, hundreds of thousands of times, they too should have access to that same information. Absolutely. A couple more questions. This is from Tim. Can you share some thoughts on the emerging roles of cloud strategies and their impacts with healthcare? I think it's a classic example of a disruptive technology where you start off with something that, you know, feels more comfortable to have your data sitting right there next to me. I can tap pat it, right? <laughs> Um, and, you know, I don't know, there's maybe device integration was an issue in, in, in the early days, and what, what, what about the bandwidth, the requirements, and so forth. But as time goes on, those issues are dealt with, and you really see the scalability and the cost uh, advantages of being able to have cloud-based uh, mm -hmm. solutions. There are, of course, issues that have to be uh, addressed and looked at and by, by the purchasers around, you know, what are the fail-safes and the backups and the contingency plans and so forth. But I think it's really exciting, particularly in combination with mobile technology, so you don't have you know, any information that actually stays on these things. Mm -hmm. It's in the cloud. And when your session has ended, there's no patient information to be breached. It's very powerful. 